Well, quite a few of you. I hadn't got time to go back and, and uh, go over everything I've taught, but I started teaching about how it's God's will uh, that he had a plan for you that was written in his book before you were ever born. We were ministering out of Psalms 139, 14 through 16, and we went through a bunch of things. We wound up in Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it's God's will for you to be a living sacrifice. And if you will do that and then renew your mind through the word of God, you will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And this is what jump-started my life. I just knew that God had a purpose for me, but I didn't know what it was. And when I got to seeking Him to find out His will for my life, I found out that His will isn't for me to be a preacher. Now, it is in a sense. I'm not, an, I'm not disagreeing with people who say it's God's will for you to have a vocation. But God's will for you is to be a living sacrifice. And then how He uses you is really a secondary thing. You know, it's not my ministry that is the focus of my life. It's Jesus that's the focus of my life. And this is just how he has told me to, uh, you know, use my relationship with him. And if you ever get that wrong, if you ever get to where you are more concerned about what you're supposed to do than what you are supposed to be, then uh, that's where you get into trouble. And I can promise you, it doesn't matter if it's ministry or if it's business or whatever it is, if it's raising a family, Whatever it is, there's going to be ups and downs. And if you are focused on the things you're supposed to do instead of your relationship with God, during those down times, man, you'll feel like quitting and wondering about, have I failed and stuff. But if your focus is on the Lord, well, then you're steady. You're consistent. I hear people all the time talk about these mountaintops and valleys, and yet Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we were in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy at His right hand or pleasures forevermore. You shouldn't fluctuate. You shouldn't be up and down. And you know, I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back. I'm saying this to thank the Lord and glorify the Lord. But when people introduce me, the number one thing they introduce is say, He's the same all of the time. And I think, what's everybody else? That to me is a strange introduction, but apparently there are people that are one thing in the pulpit, one thing when they're, you know, up in front of people or something, but then behind the scenes, they're different. And to me, that's a hypocrite. But if your faith is in the Lord, if your relationship is in the Lord, then even if you're going through a bad time, Jesus is the same. I remember one time, I won't tell you what it was, but we had something so bad happen to us that it made Paul Harvey's worldwide broadcast. Wendell heard it. And uh, I was scheduled to teach in school that morning. And man, before I could even leave the house, here came Wendell and Linda and they were bringing donuts for us and they were <laughs> coming to comfort us and, and say, we've covered your uh, classes in school today. You don't have to teach. And I said, why not? And he says, well, we heard what happened. And I said, Jesus hadn't changed. I'm not gonna go tell them about what happened to me. I'm gonna tell them about Jesus. And I went and ministered in school. Now, I'm not blaming anybody else who does it differently, but I'm saying if your faith is in the Lord, well then, you know, nothing, you're like Teflon. Nothing can stick. It's just like you're in a bubble. And this is what I was trying to get across is that God's will for you is to be a living sacrifice and then you've got to renew your mind. But what I want to talk about this morning is the hindrances to once you know what God's will is and once you're heading in that direction, you are going to meet resistance. I think I said this the other night, but if you never jump, uh, bump into the devil, it's because you're both headed in the same direction. You start turning and going the direction that God wants you to go and there is going to be resistance. There is going to be opposition. And you know the biggest hindrance to people fulfilling God's will now, I've been talking about finding God's will, but now that, you know, if you've found it, if God is leading you, what is the biggest hindrance to fulfilling God's will? And it may surprise you to find out it's you. You are the biggest problem you will ever have. Amen. And a lot of people say, oh, no, that's not so. But really, we tend to be so self-sufficient in thinking that, God, thank you for showing me what I can do. I, I can understand why you chose me. What a wise choice. <laughs> and now I can take it from here. And this is where most people get into problems. I want to use Moses as an example of this. You know, it says in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, all of the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, our instruction, so that we through them might 
uh, have comfort and uh, patience and comfort of the scriptures. Is that the way it says it? Might uh, have hope. All of these things were written for our learning. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, that all of the things that were written in the Old Testament are so that we might learn, not to blaspheme and stuff. And then verse 11, it repeats it again. So I'm going to use the example of Moses and uh, just share some things with you. Moses knew what God's will was for his life, but he totally blew how God was going to use him. And he caused himself and the children of Israel a lot of pain. And so uh, in Exodus chapter 2, I'm just going to break in and read a few of these verses because I got a lot to say here. But in Exodus chapter 2, in verse 10, it says, And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. This is talking about his mother was hired to nurse Moses, and she brought him back unto Pharaoh's daughter, and Moses became her son, and she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And, set, and he said unto them, what... Um, that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy uh, fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely the thing is known. And Pharaoh heard about it, and Moses fled into the wilderness. And according to Acts chapter 7, Moses dwelt in the wilderness for 40 years before he had this burning bush experience with God. Let me turn over to Acts chapter 7 and read this to you because uh, if you put all of the scriptures together, this is different than the way most people have heard the story of Moses. For instance, most people are more, I believe, impacted by the movie, The Ten Commandments, than they are by the Bible because they don't study the Bible very much. But, you know, the scripture says Second. Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, study this, show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. If you study the scriptures, the scriptures give commentary on what happened in the Old Testament. If you were to just read Exodus chapter 2 by itself, you could read into it all of the things that were portrayed in that movie, The Ten Commandments. But when you read the Bible, that's not the way that it happened. Look at this in Acts chapter 7, this is Stephen, the very first martyr of the church. He had uh, been called before the Sanhedrin for uh, the way he was teaching against the law of Moses. Not really against it, but teaching that it was fulfilled and that we were now under a new covenant. And so he began to start rehearsing Jewish history. And he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It said he was moved by the Holy Spirit and said this. So this was God speaking through him. And uh, he was the very far first martyr of the church. And so what he was saying was inspired by God. And he recounted the history of Moses. Look at what he said in Acts chapter 7, beginning with verse 20. It says, In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, this is the only place in scripture that tells us how old he was when he killed this Egyptian. But this says, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed, this is telling you what he was thinking. He supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Now this totally changes the way that most people perceive this. Moses knew who he was. Moses knew that God had called him to bring deliverance. He supposed when he killed this Egyptian that his brethren would understand that God had raised him up to bring deliverance to the Jews. So again, this is different than it was portrayed in that movie. They portrayed him as just a good old boy and he was just thrust into these things and he had no choice in it. 
Moses knew what God's will for his life was. Keep your finger there. I think I'm going to come back. I'm not sure. But look over here in Hebrews chapter 11. And here's another commentary on Moses. In Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 23, it says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. This wasn't something that happened to him against his will and, and God was just sovereignly moving him into this. He knew who he was. He refused to identify with Pharaoh. It says in verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He chose this. Moses knew what God's will for his life was, and he chose to go out. And when he killed the Egyptian, he was trying to bring God's will to pass. He was trying to bring deliverance to the Jews. Now, this is really important because what I want to get across today is it's absolutely essential that you find out what God's will for your life is and that you commit yourself to it. But that's just part of it. Finding God's will is relatively easy. Following God's will is where most people get off and get into trouble. And it comes because we're self-willed. We lean unto our own understanding and we think, God, thank you for picking me. I can take it from here. And then you go out and do things your own way. Did you know that Moses, uh, this isn't in the Bible, but I've read secular accounts and there are historical accounts about Moses. And Moses was a mighty general that went out and conquered the Ethiopians. If you remember in that movie, The Ten Commandments, it shows Moses bringing in all of these peacocks and all of the uh, spices and all of this stuff. That's based on secular history that he conquered the Ethiopians and brought in the largest amount of spoil that Egypt ever had. He was a mighty general and stuff. And so this was a... This was a strong man. This was a confident man. He was a leader. And I believe that when he realized that God had raised him up to bring deliverance to the Jews, he just supposed, that's what it says. He supposed his brethren would have understood how that God was going to deliver them by his hand. He just supposed, no wonder I am in Pharaoh's house. Here I am a Jew that was supposed to be killed and I wound up in Pharaoh's household. Pharaoh gave a command to kill all of the young men in Israel. And Pharaoh wound up raising up the deliverer and paying for it. Amen. Man, God's got a sense of humor. And he just supposed that no wonder I was raised in Pharaoh's house. No wonder I'm one of the greatest generals. No wonder I have all of this power. No wonder that everybody... Uh, respected him and honored him. And he just supposed that God was going to use his position to bring deliverance to the Jews. Let me tell you that if you and I had been in Moses' shoes, I believe that the vast majority of us would have made the same mistake, thinking that certainly God is going to use this position. Why would I be in this position? Why would I have all of this respect? Why would I be second or third in command if God wasn't going to use my position to bring deliverance to the Jews? It made perfect sense. It just turned out not to be God's will. I can tell you, God is very seldom going to do things the way you think he's going to do things. The ways of God are different than the ways of man. And there's many scriptures, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. The biggest problem that we have in following God is the fact that we love ourselves and are so impressed with who we are. We think we're awesome. No wonder, God, you chose me. I can see the wisdom of it. What a great choice. The moment you do that, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And I can tell you, this is the number one thing that hinders people from following God is just self-reliance. And Moses is a great example of it. He had everything going for him, but God wasn't going to use his military position, his position in the government to bring deliverance. He was going to do it in a totally different way. 
And I'm telling you, to find out what God's will for your life is, is one thing. But then to get to a place to where you can follow him and let God lead you to accomplish it. That is a totally, totally separate thing. And most people miss it right here. And it really goes back to the very first step I talked about on Thursday night, that they've not made themselves a living sacrifice. They may love God. They may want to serve God, but they think, God, I can handle it. No, you can't handle it. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23 says, Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. And you know, if you read that in context, he's talking about the judgment that was coming on Israel. And he just began to say, God, how could this happen to the people that were the apple of God's eye, the people who were separated and above all people of the earth? How could people that were God's special people fall to this place to where they are just being totally oppressed? And he gives the answer. It's because that we are not smart enough to run our own life. We leaned unto our own understanding and that's the reason that it happened. You know, if your life is a mess, I say in this in love, but I can guarantee you it's because you did it your way. You and Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Unless Frank Sinatra repented at the end of his life, which, you know, I don't know anything about this. I don't wish bad on him, but unless he repented, I believe part of hell is going to be him singing, I did it my way, over and over and over, and he's going to have to live through eternity realizing he did it his way. I'm telling you, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, I got a new series I'm going to be putting out, and, it, and one of the points I'm going to be making is that the, one of the misconceptions that people have today is that people are basically good. That if everybody, if we would just get together and sing Kumbaya and love each other around a campfire, that, that everything would work out. If we would get the Muslims and just sit down and if we could just reason and if we could just talk with everybody, everything would work out. That is not what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God teaches that we're evil at our core. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is evil, desperately wicked above all. I forgot how it says it. Put that up there. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's what the Bible says about us. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We were born unto the devil. We are enslaved unto the devil. It says in that same context that the spirit of the devil worked in all of us at one time. You know, I, I could get plumb off the subject right here. But the shootings that we're having, the violence in our nation and stuff, people are saying, oh, it's mental illness. It's evil is what it is. It's demonic. It says... It says in Psalms chapter 36, verse 1, the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before them. People at their core are evil. Now, when you get born again, God changes that core, but it left behind an unrenewed mind and you've got to change your mind. So I'm not saying this about believers, but people that don't know the Lord are in union with the devil and they are evil at their core. And you know what keeps that evil from dominating is a fear of God. Our nation has lost a fear of God. It says in Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance in every evil way do I hate. If you don't hate pride and arrogance in every evil way, you do not have the fear of the Lord. And we have removed the fear of the Lord from our society today. The problem isn't guns. And again, I don't want to get into a debate and stuff, but guns don't kill people. It's people that kill people and they use guns. <laughs> Guns don't kill people any more than forks kill, make people fat. <laughs> it's evil in the heart of man. And when you remove a fear of God, well, then people start doing weird things. And so the long-term solution is to put a fear of God back into this nation, which that is a long-term solution. It's not going to happen today or tomorrow. And until you get a fear of God, there needs to be a fear of man. And if we would, anyway, I've gone far enough on that. But the point is, see, people think that we are basically good and, oh, God, I'm awesome. 
And I, I just thank you that you chose me and I can handle it from here. If I ever get in trouble, I'll come to you and ask for help. And that's where you miss the things of God. That's what Moses did. Moses just assumed that he was anointed by God and put in this position, but that was not God's will. You know, we do this same thing today. We have movie stars, athletes, people who are already famous, who uh, have an encounter with the Lord, and the scripture specifically says not to put a novice in a position of authority, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And yet we will take people that have only been born again a week, a month, or whatever, and because they're already famous, we think, well, let's make them a poster child, put them up there, and they start speaking for the Lord, and, and we violate what God says, thinking we know better. And it leads to trouble every time. Many of you are too young to know about B.J. Thomas, but the guy who wrote Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head and stuff like this, B.J. Thomas, back in, I guess it was the 70s or 80s, he got born again. And immediately he went on every talk show. He was on all of the Christian programs and he became a spokesman for Christianity. But you know what? When you're born again, you're born again a baby. <laughs> Amen. You are not spiritually mature the moment you get born again. I don't care how famous you are. And this guy started making some stupid statements that were not biblical. And so the Christians turned on him and he got into the flesh and turned on the Christians and it became uh, a mockery and it hurt the cause of Christianity. And anyway, in the 90s or somewhere around 2000, I heard from B.J. Thomas again and he had grown and he said the worst thing that could have ever happened is when I got born again is for people to make me a spokesman for Christianity. He says, I made some wrong mistakes and when people criticized me, I responded wrong. And anyway, he's now grown past it and stuff and praise God for that. But see, we just violate the word. We suppose, oh God, I know better. This man is so famous that man, let's use him. And whether he's got character or not, we lean unto our own understanding. That's what stops the will of God from coming to pass more than the devil. Satan can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. That is quite a statement right there. Satan exists. Satan is going about seeking whom he may devour, but he can't devour you without your consent and cooperation. And it is you, depending upon your own self, it's you not being a living sacrifice that is your biggest enemy. And Satan uses this selfishness in your own thinking to hinder you. And this is exactly what happened with Moses. You know, just for time's sake, I'm going to have to rush through some things but I encourage you to get this teaching that I've got entitled How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will. But let me go through it. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, is where Abraham had a covenant with the Lord. And God told him to cut these animals in two and, and separate them. And then a smoking, uh, let's see, a lamp and a smoking furnace passed through the pieces. And God cut a covenant with Abraham. And he told Abraham, if you can count the stars in the sky or count the grains of sand on the seashore, so shall your seed be. And Abraham believed God, Genesis 15, 6, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. This is quoted a number of times in the New Testament, Romans chapter 4, Galatians chapter 3, and other places. This is where Abraham became righteous is when he believed the promise of God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But the Lord went on and prophesied to Abraham in Genesis 15 that your children are going to be strangers in a land for 400 years. And after that, they will come out. And he says, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And so God prophesied that there would be 400 years in bondage. Look at this in Exodus chapter 12. And in verse 40, this is after Moses had finally had his burning bush encounter with the Lord and he went and, and released the plagues upon Egypt and they came out. And this is instructions about how to take the Passover and stuff. And it says in Exodus chapter 12 and in verse 40, now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day. The selfsame day as what? 
the self-same day as that experience in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And you can see this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. Can you put that up on the screen so that I don't have to turn over and read it? It says, and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God, uh, before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after cannot annul that it should make the promise of none effect. This, if you read it in context, was talking about that exact covenant in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And the law that was given 430 years after could not disannul. So that 430 years is counted from the time that God made this covenant with uh, Abraham, not the time that the children of Israel were in Egypt. You know, I don't want to get too specific with this. Uh, I'll lose you. But anyway, just for those of you who are thinking about this, just file this piece away and then I'll get on with what I'm saying. But the Jews didn't spend more than 225 years maximum in Egypt, and they couldn't have spent more than 150 years in bondage. If you take the 71 years that Joseph lived after the Jews went into Egypt and subtract that from this 225 years that they were there, they couldn't have lived but 150 something years under oppression. This is talking about that they were strangers during this entire time when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were wandering in the promised land. That was part of this 400 years. But my point in bringing all of this up is to say that God prophesied that they would be there for 400 years. This says they were there 430 years to the day. There's a 30 year discrepancy. And again, the only place you can find this is over in Acts chapter 7. If we would have kept reading, after Moses spent this 40 years in the wilderness, if you add all of this up and you subtract the 40 years that he spent in the wilderness from the 430 years that the children of Israel uh, waited until they came out of Egypt, that means that when Moses killed this Egyptian that we read about in Exodus chapter 2, it was only the 390th year of their captivity. Moses was 10 years premature trying to bring God's will to pass. Now that's important. I can tell you one thing. God, he's never late, but he's seldom early. If God said it was going to be 400 years, it was going to be 400 years. And he went on to say in Genesis 15 that the reason was because the iniquity of the Amorites wasn't full yet. He set a time when this was going to happen. Moses knew what God's will for him was, and he just supposed God was going to do it through his might, through his position, through his power. And if he knew the prophecy of Genesis 15, which I believe he did because the Jews were very steeped in passing the oral traditions down and they were looking for this deliverance, they were praying for it. If Moses knew about this prophecy, he in his mind just justified and says, but God, we can't wait. You know, there were millions of Jews in slavery and they were dying with their prayers for deliverance going unanswered. And it would have been easy for Moses to say, but God, I know you love us and I know you want to deliver us. You've already prophesied you're going to deliver us. We can't wait another 10 years. What, let's just say that there was 100,000 Jews dying per year. Could have been many more than that. But 100,000 Jews dying under slavery and Moses was just grieved knowing that I'm their answer. I'm going to bring them out of deliverance. It would have been easy for him to say, but God, if we wait another 10 years, then that will be 1 million Jews that die with their prayers unanswered. God, I've got to do something now. You know, I had a guy in my Bible school who was the spokesman for the first year students, promoting from first to second year. And he was fired up. He was a great guy. He witnessed and saw a lot of people born again. And he had a word from God that he was going to lead a million people to the Lord. That was his goal. And when he got into second year, I was teaching on this exact thing and teaching about that you need to become submissive to God and find God's plan for accomplishing things and not do things your own way. He stood up and challenged me openly in class. And he started giving statistics. How many people die every hour without knowing the Lord? 
and how many people, people die in a year and stuff. And he says, I can't wait years for God to do this. People are dying. And if I wait, well, then there would be so many millions of people die that, that I could have led to the Lord. And he says, no, I'm going to do it now. And I said, look, you can't microwave your ministry. It just takes a while for you to grow and become mature and be able to do this. And he got so mad, he quit school because he was going to go lead a million people to the Lord. And that's been 20 years ago. And I've never heard of him. And I can guarantee you, if he would have led a million people to the Lord, I'd have heard of this guy. That's not the way it works. It doesn't matter how you justify it. You can say, but people are dying. We got to do something right now. Well, you know, you can count statistics. You can say, let's just say again that the Jews, there was a thousand Jews dying per year over 10 years. That'd be a million Jews dying. How many Jews died during 30 years of extra bondage that they went through because of Moses' disobedience? God said they were going to be there 400 years, but because of Moses' disobedience, they spent an extra 30 years in bondage. How many Jews died? Again, if you use 100,000 per year, then that would be what? A bunch. Over 30 years. If, it, if 10 years would be a million, well, then 30 years would be 3 million. 3 million Jews died. You can sit there and say, there's so many people dying. I've got to go right now. But if you go out and do things self-will and mess up God's plan for your life, how many people are going to get be turned off to the Lord because of your self-will? You know, there's some major Christian ministers that I don't know personally, but have fallen into sin and have gone to jail and have lost their ministry and they've been mocked and stuff. And I personally, I don't know them, but personally, I believe that they are born again, that they love God, that they were trying to do the right thing, but they didn't have the character to sustain the ministry and they wound up costing themselves a lot of pain and they have turned many, many, many people against the Lord because of their immaturity. Matter of fact, I talked to the son of um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. He came to one of my meetings and we were talking about this. And Mahatma Gandhi was exiled from India and he was in Africa. And during his exile, he read the Bible, specifically the New Testament. And he was absolutely convinced that Jesus was the son of God. And he went to a Presbyterian church in Africa to uh, make Jesus his Lord. That was his purpose. And when he went there, the Presbyterian missionaries, they were white missionaries and they would not let him in because he was black. And he said, I would have been a Christian if I hadn't have meant one. That was his statement. And I said that and this son came up and he says, that is an exact true statement. And Mahatma Gandhi got his passive uh, resistance that he practiced from Jesus. He, Jesus was a, uh, example to him, but he didn't become a Christian. And because of that, not only was that guy not born again, but he went back and led over 700 million people in India to independence. And if he would have been a Christian, he could have led them into Christianity. Look at the millions of people that were offended because somebody knew God's will. They were over in a foreign country helping people, telling people about Jesus, but they didn't have the character and renewed that they rejected a person based on the color of their skin. That was not Jesus. And I can guarantee you, one of the worst things that you will ever experience trying to fulfill God's will is you. And you're going to go out and do it in your own strength and power. It just takes time for God to get you out of you. It takes time for God to work on you. And Moses, see, he knew God's will. All of these things I'm saying, he knew God's will and he was going to go out and bring it to pass in his own strength and power. And because of it, he could have stayed in the palace. He could have spent the extra 10 years in the lap of luxury. He didn't have to go through the wilderness. Again, the Ten Commandments, that movie shows, you know, as Moses heads out into the desert, then the narrator comes on. And so he goes into the desert where scorpions and snakes are and where prophets are made. And it starts telling you that you got to suffer and be beat down before you can be used to God. God didn't put Moses into the wilderness. Moses put Moses into the wilderness. Moses could have stayed in the lap of luxury. Well, why did God reveal it to him 10 years early? Because it takes 10 years to get any of us usable. 
Did you know if you study the life of David, most people believe David was 17 years old when the Lord anointed him, 1 Samuel chapter 16, and he was 30 when he became king. That's 13 years. And then he still had seven years until he ruled the entire nation. So if you put it all together, that's 20 years. Joseph, it was 22 years before the first positive, well, excuse me, 13 years before the first positive thing happened, 22 years before his dreams came to pass and his brethren came and bowed down to him. You can take in the New Testament, Saul, it took three and a half years for him in the desert to be prepared. I'm telling you, it takes time for God to work in your life. And our biggest problem is the fact that we are impatient and God, I know what you want me to do and I'm going to get it done right now. Lean under your own understanding. You'll mess the whole thing up. I had a man in one of my meetings and it was a minister's conference and this has been 30 years ago. And I called ministers forward and I was going to pray for him. And so I started down here at this end and he was the, he was the first one. And I don't know, I didn't know what was wrong, but I just knew that it, it wasn't right to pray for this guy. So I skipped him and I started praying for the second one. And I went all the way down the row. And when I got down to the end, this guy was down there. He had gotten out of line and come down there and I saw him and I just stopped and I started to walk back and he grabbed me and he says, why won't you pray for me? And I said, you don't want me to pray for you. And he says, yes, I do. So anyway, I started praying and I prophesied over him. I said, you aren't ready. You've been rebuking this and thinking the devil is keeping your ministry from working. It's God that's keeping your ministry from working. It's God that's closed doors because not because he doesn't love you. It's because he does love you. If God was to put you out there in the front without the character to handle it, you would fall apart like a $2 suitcase. It's because God loves you so much that he's not opened doors. You know, we had a man yell at Creflo yesterday and I was just so impressed. Creflo just keeps going and no problem. That doesn't happen overnight. Now, I don't know. I've only known Creflo seven or eight years, but I can guarantee you God's been working on Creflo for decades. Creflo, every time he's been through things, it takes time to mature to a place that you can just, what's the chaff to the week and you keep your, your focus on the things of God. If God would have put Creflo or me or any of us in the positions that we occupy right now without going through this learning process and stuff, it would destroy us. You know, right now I have to have five and a half million dollars a month to survive. And I need more than that. I could use twice that much. But that's the bare minimums. And if God would have put that on me 20 years ago, it would have killed me. I couldn't have lived through it. You have to grow and mature. And it is the mercy of God that has kept me where I was. And yet I can show you, matter of fact, this guy that I was talking about, he says, you prophesy over me. And I told him, it's God that's holding you back. Turned out he had been a homosexual and he had only been born again six months. And he was just burning to get out there and start preaching to the homosexuals and see homosexuals get saved and set free. And that's all a good desire. But he went ahead and pushed the doors open, knocked them down. And within two or three years, the guy was back into homosexuality. He burnt and he just couldn't maintain it. He didn't have the character. Amen or oh me. I tell you what I'm saying here is really important. It's one thing to find God's will and to head in that direction. But the biggest problem that people have is that they start doing it their way. They lean under their own understanding and that is a recipe for disaster. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. God has given us the choice. He's given us the freedom. He doesn't force you to do anything. But the right choice is to recognize that God, I'm nothing without you and that I need you. I need your wisdom and I need your understanding. You know, this is one of the reasons, and again, I don't want to make this a law to where it condemns people, but this is one of the reasons that it's good to do things debt free. Because you know what? You can do things through the world system, go borrow money, and you can stretch yourself and get things accomplished that you don't have the character to be able to sustain. And you can get yourself into trouble. But if you just say, I'm going to, you know, owe no man anything like the scripture says, I guarantee if God doesn't come through, you aren't going to do it. 
We're building the second building. And I remember when it first started and we just had the steel up. Man, it looked impossible. We needed $53 million. We're down now to less than $5 million. We've gone a long ways. But I remember telling our students, I said, I am not going to go in debt. And I had people pressuring me to go in debt. I have a banker that is a partner of mine that says they will loan me $100 million on just my personal word because we've got so much assets. I can go get $100 million tomorrow. And he's bugging me. And I said, I'm not going to do it. And I said, uh, because if God isn't in this, I don't want it. And because of that, it's like Creflo was talking about not spending your peace. Man, I've got peace. And I've told my students, I said, if that thing, if something was to happen and if it never got finished, I want it to stand there as a monument to my ego and show people that this is what Andrew did in his flesh and stuff. And I think that's good. I mean, I honestly, uh, I'm in a position where if God doesn't come through, I'm dead. Amen. <laughs> and that's a great place to be. It's just awesome. And you don't get there overnight. You know, good home cooking is different than fast food. It takes longer. And if you are going to reach your full potential, you know what? You need to become dependent upon God. And brothers and sisters, this is... This is Satan's inroad into our life, is our self-sufficiency. And you know how you deal with that? You become a living sacrifice. You crawl up on the altar and you become a living sacrifice. The problem with the living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar. <laughs> this is something you don't do just one time. You got to live this way. Live this way. And, you know, when you make a commitment to the Lord, some people will, man, they'll have an experience. God, I give you everything. I love you. I want your way. And, and they just commit themselves to the Lord, but then they don't stick with it. And then they realize a month or a year or something down the road that, whoops, I've got off track. Oh, God, I failed you. I've got to recommit my life. If you have to recommit, rededicate, you were never dedicated in the first place. There is no such word as rededicate in the dictionary. You can't find it. If you truly dedicate something, it's dedicated. But that doesn't mean that you're perfect. You will make mistakes along the way. And all you got to do is when you realize, that, whoops, God, this is not what I've committed to. Here I am, my flesh rising up again. You just get back on course. And you just continue. It's wrong for you to think that if you commit yourself to the Lord that you're never going to have another flesh flesh. It doesn't work that way. I can guarantee you, you will. You will get into the flesh. You know, when I was in Vietnam, going through basic in Vietnam is when they landed on the moon. And I wasn't, didn't have access to television. So I missed all of this stuff. I heard about it, but I never saw it. And so I've always been interested in that. I've read books on it and stuff. And I met Jim Irwin, one of our astronauts that walked on the moon. And we were on a television program together. And so, man, I just, I was thrilled to meet somebody who had walked on the moon. And I started asking him questions like, uh, how do you go to the bathroom in weightlessness? <laughs> Things that you don't read in most books. And he told me, he said he never did master it. He says... <laughs> He made a mess every time. So anyway, <laughs> we share, he signed his books and gave them to me and I signed my books and gave them to him. And anyway, as we were talking about all of this, I was just impressed. Did you know I found out that your cell phone has like a hundred times as much computing power as the computers in the Apollo spacecrafts? Your cell phone is like a hundred times more powerful. It was it was amazing the way that they got there. And he told, I thought that they just went there perfectly. He says that they just threw that capsule towards the moon. And every 10 minutes for four and a half days, they had a course correction. Every 10 minutes. And he says sometimes that capsule was flying 90 degrees opposite the moon. And they would have to have a burn to get them back. Other times they were just a fraction of a degree off. But the truth is they went to the moon like this. And then they had a 500 mile long landing strip that they had picked out to land in. And when they landed on the moon and he got out of the lunar module, 
he was less than five feet missing a 500 mile long landing strip. And what I learned through that was it wasn't perfect. They didn't do it perfectly. They just headed in that direction and then they made course corrections. This is the way it is when you commit yourself to the Lord and become a living sacrifice. You won't do it perfectly. I've had people come up after I preach on this and say, would you please pray over me and just cast this selfishness out of me? The only way I can get rid of selfishness is to kill you and then you'll be perfect. <laughs> but as long as you're breathing in this life, you are going to be selfish and you are going to have a tendency to lean under your own understanding and to think that you can do it. And you just have to blast off and start moving in this direction and then God will give you course corrections. I get course corrections every day of my life. And it doesn't mean that I didn't commit myself in 1968. It just means that I've still got flesh. And when I see the flesh rise up, I have to deal with it. If you don't understand this, it's like going back and starting over all the time. You'll never reach the moon. You'll never reach your destination. If every time you blow it, you let the devil convince you that, see, you weren't really committed to God. No, that's not the way it is. Now, there are some people that just go through the motions and mouth it, but I'm saying, you, I made a commitment to the Lord in 1968, and there was nothing left for me to give. I gave him everything I but I hadn't been perfect. And I've gotten into pride, and I've, I've done things that are embarrassing. It was just two years ago that God showed me something. I forget now exactly what it was, but it embarrassed me to think that here I've been walking with the Lord for all of these years, and I hadn't even realized this. But see, God will just show you things one time, step at a time. If he was to show you everything in you that's messed up, you couldn't live with yourself. And you couldn't have any faith that God's ever going to use you. But from God's standpoint, every one of us has a lot of problems, a lot of hang-ups. He can't show you everything, but he loves you. And one of the reasons that he hasn't opened things up for you yet is because you haven't learned to be God-dependent. You're self-dependent. And it's because of his great love for you that he hasn't opened up doors, made your business work, hadn't made all of these things. One of the reasons you hadn't been promoted is because you don't have the character to be able to handle it. Amen or oh me. Yeah.